start the recording. Excellent. So, um, so we agreed to have uh, new deadlines for the SA2 and SA3. Um, the first SA deadline is 9th of April and then the review 16th. And for the second, for the third one, for the second round, uh, after this one, deadline on SA on April 30th, and we will discuss them and then reviews at the end of the course, which is May 5th. Um, I have prepared a short discussion uh, for today about the, the essays that have been written uh, and the reviews that have been written. Um, so we will, yeah, I will kind of mostly discuss myself, I guess. Uh, um, so the things that I want you to pay attention or to think uh, listed in table one at the top. Um, so the first one is the structure. Uh, what does it mean, structure? Uh, every time we present something, we write something, we doing it whether we want it or not within a certain structure. Um, and that can be m more or less formalized, can be better or worse, but we have to think about it. We have to think what is the structure uh, for the piece that we're writing and what are elements of that structure and which ones we are ignoring on purpose and which, uh, which ones are, are we ignoring by mistake. Um, and we have to kind of uh, take ownership of the structure itself. So the, the easiest, like the very m most primitive structure that we have is we have a title, beginning, middle, at the end, right? That's that's it. That's like there is no uh, going lower than that. Um, and then we can put a little bit more elaborate structures in it, uh, but we always have the basic one. So we always have you know the title, uh, and then we have the beginning the middle and the end. Uh, and we have to think what goes into the title, what goes into the beginning, the middle and the end. So with some of the um, essays, uh, it wasn't that clear. And some essays didn't even have the title. Um, and some essays didn't have kind of a, a, a kind of a thought out structure. Uh, it was kind of a, it didn't have identifiable beginning, middle and at the end even. Uh, so why do we do that? Why do we have structure in the, in the writing that we do? What's the purpose of it? Can make it easier to read, I guess. Exactly. It, it basically helps us to communicate with the reader. The reader is someone who will be reading the piece and they have certain expectations and they kind of expect to have a title, the beginning, middle, at the end, right? And if we don't do that, they either will be a little bit confused or they'll be surprised or, you know. Um, so th th there is kind of a uh, writing something, it's not a monologue, it's a dialogue between you, the writer and the reader. Uh, and you have to establish certain uh, communication patterns. And some of them are already established uh, because of the structure uh, and some yeah, you can kind of define as you go along. You can say, well, now we're going to look into this. You can change the structure. You can change the beginning, middle, at the end into fourth type structure, like starting with some executive summary, for example, and then have the beginning, middle, at the end and so on. Um, but the, and, and there is no um, there is no kind of a golden rule of what you should do. It's just that you should think about it. <laughs> That's the golden rule, right? Uh, the way you're doing it, it's up to you. You can follow the expectations or you can kind of divert a little bit from the expectations, but you have to put a conscious effort into what you're doing, right? And then with some essays, it's clear that somebody thought about it. And then with some essays, it's clear that it wasn't thought out. It just happened, right? Um, so structure, it's the, that's the first point. 
The second one is um, the title, concise summary, well-defined purpose. Um, so we need something um, to hook, to ground what it is about. So I don't, the reader doesn't need to read the whole thing to understand what it is about, because then maybe that's a waste of time, or maybe they, that's not something they should be reading. So communicating early what it is for, what is it about, helps the reader to decide, should I continue reading it or not? Uh, and you don't want the reader who doesn't want to read that particular piece to read it, because first of all, it doesn't help the reader, and second of all, it's frustrating for the reader, right? And you've had that experience yourself, like you don't want to read something you don't want to read, but you don't know it until you know it. So the earlier you know it, the better, right? And that's what this kind of a title, concise summary, or well-defined purpose comes into play. It should be early. Uh, it shouldn't be the, the, the end. It should be the beginning. Um, so by carefully choosing a title, you will already filter out people who are not interested. By carefully deciding what, you know, how to summarize at the beginning what it is about, or to define what the purpose is, we already filter those people who are not interested as well. We only want to leave the readers who are re interested and um, they want to read the, the thing. So title and concise summary are, are easy uh, because, you know, title is a title. You, you, we already discussed the kind of elements of, of good titles and so on. Uh, and then concise summary is just like, you know, try to explain very briefly what it is about. Um, Defining a purpose, that's a little bit more complicated. So uh, reading the essays, I can tell that they were done for at least three different reasons, right? Um, some people did them to convince to a point. Uh, so some people wrote an essay trying to prove or highlight a particular point to convince the reader that this is true or whatever. Other people were um, explaining something. So the, the main purpose was to explain, not necessarily to convince, but to kind of explore and explain a particular area. And then the third one was reviewing somebody else's work, right? So some, some uh, essays were in a form of review of a paper and they were highlighting what the paper was about and what were good and bad things about the paper. So there were like three main reasons used in the essays, but none of the essays clearly said that up front, that this essay is about that. I, I mean, some did, um, so I, I take it back. Like, I remember some essays were clear that it is a review, uh, but some were not. So again, um, kind of defining the purpose and defining what this essay is about also helps the reader to frame a kind of a state of mind, right? Um, so talking about this, um, the iteration that we're gonna do. We're gonna do three iterations. So the first one is, I mean, th those things are not graded per, as such. Um, the, you, you're just doing it to gain some, some insights and some skills. Uh, so there is no like good and bad things, but I'm hoping that by doing it first time and getting feedback and comments, you can kind of uh, tailor it and get a little bit more uh, valuable um, understanding of what to do and what not to do. So, um, in the first one, we didn't define exactly what has, what has to happen. And those three purposes were fine. Like choosing one of them, it's fine, no problem. For the second one, what we want is we want to have a claim. We want to have kind of a convincing something, somebody to someone, uh, something, somebody to something, but you cannot do convincing without the review. So the review will be part of the essay, but it will not be the sole purpose of the essay, right? So what we want in the second iteration of the essays is to have part of the essay dedicated to the review of the other people's research for the purpose of getting some evidence for, convic for convincing the reader to something, right? So we want the main purpose to be convincing somebody to something. And as a mechanic, as a uh, tool, we will use the review. Um, some people did that in this um, essay already. Uh, some didn't. But for the next essay, that's the goal. 
the goal is to convince um, and use the review as a backend, right? As a kind of the um, mechanic. For the third one, we will want explain and convince. Well, you will say, yeah, how, how can I convince without explaining? Well, you kind of don't have to put that much emphasis on explaining. In the third one, th there is not a lot of difference because you cannot really do review without explaining and you can do convincing without explaining. But for the second one, you can kind of don't explain too much. You can keep it short or you cannot even explain. You can just say, look, they have this data, that's evidence, that's it, right? You don't have to explain a lot of uh, rationale. For the third one, we want to expand on the explanations. So it, it's not possible to do something without the other elements at all, but you can kind of minimize it, right? All right, so the second essay is convince plus review. The third one will be convince explain plus review. Uh, for the second and third, I don't want the review to be the main part. It's not. The convincing is the main part in both the second and the third. Uh, the review is just the kind of an element to uh, achieve what we need, which is the convincing, right? All right. So then I have um, claim. So what we need is we writing something and then somewhere in the writing we have something of value. So for the reader, they say, oh, okay, aha. Or they say, oh, you know, that was worth it. I, it was worth reading it, right? So what it is, what it is that it's of value, what it could be, what do you think? What do you read sometimes and you say, oh yeah, it was worth reading. I kind of... Uh... Proper methodology? Yeah. They did the research so they have like claims so they can make, I guess. Yeah, so what you're saying is if the if, if the writing follows a, a proper methodology and is logical and draws the logical conclusions, the value for you are those conclusions that the paper draws. Yeah? Perfect. What else? What else can be of value? Uh, different kind of metrics that can give you ideas for the, for, for the things. Yeah, so you can have um, some presentation of data, which is of value. You can have some ideas or some questions or research questions, which you haven't thought of, uh, which you can then use for your own work. Um, you can have some um, elaborations of what's known and what's solved and what is not known and what's not solved yet. That's of value as well, because then it kind of guides your interest in a particular domains that are not solved yet. Uh, it can tell you, the paper can tell you what is the state of the art, like what is the best method of achieving something. And that's of value because then you don't need to search of what's the best way of doing something. You just given it on the plate, like the, the writing explains to you and tells you what it is. Um, so there, there is a lot of things that can be of value, right? So when you're preparing an essay, when you're writing an essay, you have to ask yourself, what is it that in my essay will be of value? What will be the value for the reader after I finished it, after it's written? What is that thing of value, right? So um, it can be uh, a demonstration of something. It can be a logical argumentation for something. It can be a lot of different things, right? And it can be more than one thing. Uh, but when you start writing, before you write anything, you have to ask yourself what it is that it will be once I'm done. And then you, you guide the process to, to, to that purpose, right? Um, so, for example, if, um, let's say I want to do a review. For my first essay, I want to do a review. Um, should I do the review in such a way that the reader doesn't need to read the original paper at all? I could. I could write the review in such a way that I kind of explain, summarize, and critique the original paper in such a way that I don't want the reader to read it. I just, the reader will know everything it's, 
he or she needs to know by reading my summary, my review, right? Or I can encourage the reader to read the original paper. I can explain what it is about, what it is, uh, for whom it is, and if the reader is that target audience, they should read the paper. If they are not, they will not, right? But I, I don't want to prevent them reading. I don't want to explain everything. I don't to want to repeat the paper again. I just want to dif differentiate between who should read it, who should not read it. And then that's of value to the reader, because then the reader can decide, yeah, I'm in this category, I should read the paper. No, I'm in this category, the paper is not for me, right? Um, you can also do that together with a judgment of the quality of the paper to help the reader to make this decision. So the value is helping the reader to make the decision, right? So there are different ways of reviewing a paper and different values, that value propositions that you can generate to the reader. Um, so again, that should be decided before you start writing the review. Uh, and that should be sort of stated in this first point, well-defined purpose, right? So if, if, if you say, I'm gonna write a review, it's not enough. Like you need to say what this review will be about, what it is for, like what's the main purpose of this review? Uh, is it to criticize it? Is it to contrast it with other pieces of work that has happened? Uh, so good reviews usually have elements of that. They put the particular research in the context of broader research and kind of discuss it how it relates to other research. Um, that's a lot of work. I mean, for a short essay, maybe that's not what you really want. Uh, you know, if you only want to cite one or two articles, you cannot do kind of a comprehensive overview of where this research fits. So then you have to tailor your review for those particular needs. So in the essay too, when you're using review as a mechanism to achieve something, to achieve kind of an argument, you only need to do that. You only tailor your review for that purpose, right? Uh, so if you're using a particular article to back up your claim, you don't want to really review the quality of that article because it's irrelevant, right? Uh, you would evaluate the quality of the review of the original article if you can contrast it with other articles that are of better quality and you want to make an argument that you should use the other one, right? But if you're only using one source and you're only using it to back up your particular claim, reviewing the quality doesn't kind of make sense, right, in that context. Uh, you could say, well, but if it's of really good quality, it kind of strengthens the argument. I'm kind of appealing to the authority kind of uh, principle, right? Uh, yeah, you could, but those are uh, not necessarily based on logic. Those are mostly based on emotions, uh, argumentations. Should you avoid that in your writing? No, you can use it. You should kind of consciously use it, right? So if you want to evaluate something logically, uh, then evaluation of the quality, if you cannot contrast it with anything else, is kind of a mute point because there is no other kind of a backing up arguments anyway, right? All right. So that's the, the third thing I have here on the list. Um, the next one is evidence, basis for the claim and logical inference. So that's what you said, that it has to be proper. It cannot be sloppy, you cannot have illogical kind of arguments, you cannot uh, have opinions, you cannot th say, I think this, therefore it's true. Uh, so it has to be based on facts. Uh, it has to be based on some evidence. And you have to find it, you have to kind of uh, um, uh, organize it in such a way. Is it possible for you to use something as an evidence which actually doesn't support the claims that you're making? Yes, <laughs> it's possible and a lot of people do that. Um, should you do that? No, you should not. Uh, you should try to be um, methodo methodologically metho methodical and kind of correct in your methodology. Um, Sometimes it's not, uh, yeah, sometimes we reach our limit of our own cognitive abilities and we kind of infer something illogically or incorrectly, 
that's okay. I mean, errors happen, but you should try to make an effort to be critical about your own writing and about your own inferences. Uh, then, if, if you are, and if the inferences and the, the logic are kind of um, solid, it strengthens the whole case. If there is just one kind of a small weak point, uh, it kind of uh, makes the whole structure weaker because then the reader kind of gets suspicious that oh, yeah, it's like I don't really think you're right, right? So even if you write in most of the cases, but some arguments you, you're making kind of uh, a little bit unfounded, then the whole thing kind of collapses. So what we usually do, we separate the things that are kind of solid, that are kind of really hard to question with the things which are somewhat speculative. Because you cannot avoid those speculations or some opinions entirely. I mean, we're trying to, but it's not possible. And also, there is value in, in your own kind of knowledge and your own opinions sometimes as well. But you try to separate it. So you try to keep the things that are kind of logically solid and logically um, uh, clean from the ones which are just opinions. And usually, you keep that in like a different paragraph or different section or different part of your essay. Right. Uh, so, can you use kind of illogical or emotion-based argumentations? Sure, you can, but try to keep it separate from the main kind of uh, um, analysis. Um, so, what we usually have, and you will have it in the thesis as well, you have something which is called like data analysis, um, and in the data analysis you just claim what the data shows. You don't have any interpretations and you don't have anything that can be misinterpreted. You just state what the data demonstrates, right? And then after that section, that chapter, you have discussion and that's separate. So that's where you put all the interpreting of the, of the data analysis, right? So if you have, um, um, I don't know, some, um, you've run some user studies and you collected some data and the data analysis, you just present what is, the, what is the data, what does it show? And you can use graphs, you can use kind of some synthesis, but it's all based on the data. And then in the data, uh, data discussion, like the discussion chapter, then you can kind of interpret it. You can point on some of the uh, dependencies and some of the relationships. Uh, but you try to keep that separate. You don't do that in the same chapter. Um, for the reason that you don't want to shake the foundations. The foundations are solid. Uh, the interpretation might be wrong, but the data is kind of what you've collected, right? Uh, so it's the same with the, with the papers. Like you can show what the paper shows. You can say they achieved those results. And then somewhere else says, and that's what it means, right? Uh, because somebody should be able to attack or provide counter arguments for the interpretation for what does it mean but they should not question your methodology if they question your methodology your data then there is nothing left that that the whole thing collapses right um, so evidence and basis for the claim and logical inference so what can we use as evidence let's say we want to claim something what we typically use as evidence what sort of data? Uh, animal uh, like test data, like uh, well, it kind of depends on the claim, but yeah, you can collect user data, for example, if it's in statistics. Statistics. Yeah. You can look at broad big data like collections from other statistics perhaps yep so what what is the source of the data where you get the data from what what you do measure studies and humans <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you you can uh, measure the natural world and measure what is out there, right? So humans, okay, you can measure like how many people come to lectures, right? So you're kind of measuring what is. Um, 
or you prepare an experiment and you measure the outcomes or the effects of the experiment, right? So you may have a setup where you have some control group and test group, uh, or like um, um, the group that is kind of subjected to some uh, some treatment, and then you kind of measure the difference, right? So you have um, in the in the case of measuring something that you don't control, you control the measurement, and you have errors. And you can have methodology methodology. Uh, methodology errors in relation to setting up the measurements. In the second case, you have what the first case had plus the methodology and the experimentation setups as well, right? So um, if I want to demonstrate something, if I want to demonstrate that, I don't know, smoking is good um, and I take number of people and I interview them after they smoke and they all say, ah, oh, great, smoking is great. Uh, I really feel better and whatever, right? Uh, does it prove anything? I have data, I have, you know, things, I run the statistics and it shows me that smoking is good. Uh, but the methodology of setting up the experiment is already broken, right? So all the steps on top of that are correct and logical and everything is fine. But the conclusion is, is nonsense because the methodology for setting up the experiment was nonsense, right? Uh, so evidence, yes, evidence is in data, but the data is collected somehow. And then you have a lot of issues of proving that the data collection and the data kind of um, uh, gathering methodology is actually correct and logical and makes sense and so on. Most of the time, it doesn't fully support all of that. Most of the time, you have to say, well, within that particular context, within that particular set of assumptions, I've done this experiment and I collected this data. And now I'm kind of trying to generalize it to claim something broader than what I actually have evidence for, right? So I may not have evidence for kind of a broader claim, but I, within this kind of a scoping, I have evidence for that and I'm now generalizing it, right? So it's, yeah, you have to kind of um, look at it from the whole pipeline point of view, like from the methods, through the experiments, through the data collection, data analysis, statistics, and so on, like how the whole chain works. And most of the time, if you really strictly follow the whole thing, you will realize that you cannot make the claim that you're making. It's always something bigger that you should be making, right? Uh, there is no other way around it. Like, so, you know, we, we cannot measure the existing world without impacting it, doing always correctly with no errors and always make the good claims at the end. Uh, it is trial and error process and a lot of claims are kind of conflicting. Sometimes you have people trying to prove something and you have an experiment or data which suggests that, and you have data that suggests the opposite, right? And then these guys publish like saying this is the case, and these guys publish and they say this is the case, right? I don't know whether I discussed it in this class, but there are some famous studies about uh, sleep in, in US, whether the white people or black people sleep more, right? And they measure the population. They just uh, actually measure like the population-wise how long they sleep. Uh, and in some studies, they say, you know, uh, African-American people sleep much longer than the white people, on average, like two hours more, right? And in some studies, they, the results are inconclusive. And in some studies, the, there is the opposite, right? That says, actually, the white people slept more, right? So how come? How, how is that possible? Uh, you might have the demographics. Uh... Exactly. Different demographics, different sampling that they've used for their study. Uh, it all impacts the result. Right, so if you say, I've run a study, I took like, you know, 10,000 people, I measured how long they sleep, and I see black people sleep more. Can I generalize it to general population? Not really, but you have some evidence suggesting that, right? You should say it, right? Because then if some other people repeat the same similar study and they confirm the suggestion, maybe we get, get enough evidence that something is true, right? There might be a, yeah. 
Exactly, and we are not taking them into account, right? So again, within the limitations of the assumptions we are making, within the variables that we are controlling, we have that conclusion. And then we have this generalization or this claim. How that relates? Well, it relates, it's kind of a, but if you're doing it right, you sort of follow the pipeline and you point out the weak spots along the way and you always make the uh, caveat saying, subject to those assumptions, I'm making those claims, right? Um, which is good because then it helps other researchers to kind of pinpoint whether your assumptions are correct or not and whether your weak points actually are correct or not, right? Uh, if you don't do that, then it's kind of hard to argue because you're kind of arguing the same point, but you don't really know exactly what the differences are. Um, okay, so then we have this um, significance, relevance, and implications uh, point. Uh, so that relates to what we were just discussing. Um, if your methodology is like super solid, everything you've done is really good, all your assumptions are correct, uh, then your significance, relevance, and implications are kind of strengthened, right? So that's, I mean, in the context of the essay, which is like two pages long, it's not that relevant. Like it, it's actually a really small piece of work and you cannot do all these thorough things uh, in, in an essay. You're kind of doing it in a sloppy way on purpose because you have really limited space, right? Uh, so some things you have to be sloppy about because you just don't have space to dig really deep into everything, right? You, you're doing some shortcuts. But in your master thesis, um, well, you know, you can have 100 pages. You don't need to use shortcuts everywhere. Can you, you, can you use shortcuts in a master thesis? Sure, you can. Do you have to use shortcuts in a master thesis? Sure, you have to. Because you cannot, like, solidly explain everything down to, you know, quantum physics that you, you, you correct, right? You will have some assumptions and you will have some shortcuts uh, because, you, you know, there is no other way. But um, you can be much more thorough and much more um, methodical uh, in your master thesis than you in the essay. But the essay has kind of a small steps, small little things that kind of lead to this logical inference and to lead to those kind of uh, good method me methodologies. Uh, so I'm not expecting in the essay for you to be kind of a uh, bullet proof in your um, conviction, uh, f convincing an argumentation you want. You can be easily like, uh, um, you know, uh, criticized for not doing certain things properly. But that's the nature of the essay. It's like short, it's okay to be kind of exposed to, uh, to criticism. In the master thesis, um, you will be exposed to criticism, but the criticism should only be on small things or it should be rather improbable, right? Um, so you, you, the reviewers can say, uh, have you thought about this? You can say, well, if, if, <laughs> if you haven't thought about something, it's kind of bad to say, I, I haven't. <laughs> uh, but if you can say, yes, I thought about this, but it's either beyond the scope or the impact is kind of, uh, I render the impact kind of not significant for the results that I'm having, right? Um, so, and also you should list all the things that could potentially have high impact in the thesis and already address them. Why do you think it's irrelevant or why do you think the impact is only limited to that or that or whatever. How can you kind of uh, remove it from the from the scope? Uh, you cannot throw everything into the scope, but you try to maximize the significance, relevance, and implications, right, um, for your master project. Um, so how 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 would you do that? Uh, if you're working on a, let's say you're working on some small improvements on some algorithm for VR, for example, right? Um, <clears throat> How would you kind of make the significance and impact of that small thing kind of bigger? Well, you put it into a bigger context. So you can say, um, you know, the, the you know, 1% speed improvement here over years of something or over thousands of computers kind of, you know, gains kind of a significance, right? Uh, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it actually is like 1% improvement is not significant, right? Um, 
and the reviewers sometimes do that. They say, well, you, you just improved a state of the art, of the art algorithm by 1%, but it costs, in terms of speed, but it costs, let's say, 30 more percent in terms of energy consumption, right? So what's the point, right? <coughs> so some, f for this point, often what you have to do is you have to step back and you have to say why I'm doing it, in what broader context does it uh, work, doesn't, doesn't work, and what are the trade-offs, like where does it fit, right? So we're doing it at the beginning, so that's what we, um, we were discussing, like what is of value, and we're doing it at the end about like the significance and the import importance and the, um, yeah, so, yeah, the point is that this, this bit is really hard. And this bit, I, for me, it's like, it was really hard when I was doing my master's and it's really hard for today as well. Um, because you, on one extreme, you don't get it and you think everything you're doing is important, right? Um, which is wrong. <laughs> on the other thing, you don't get it and you think, uh, nothing you really do in the grand scheme of things is important, <laughs> which is also not true, right? Uh, and finding your way somewhere in between those two is really hard. Um, so sometimes you work on like small thing, like it, it, is, it is kind of a small imp algorithm improvement or something, and you kind of don't really see how important it is because you think it's kind of local, it's only for this one thing, right? And it turns out it isn't, it's actually used in you know, 10 different domains and people are like using it wide, widely, right? Uh, you have to always kind of give yourself a benefit of a doubt, but you have to also do yourself a favor to doing some homework of where it can potentially be used, right? So, um, and, and that is hard when you don't uh, have kind of a global understanding on everything that happens in a particular domain. During your master's, you will get more deeper into a particular domain and you will see where the edge of science is and where the kind of the, um, the benefits are and, and so on. But placing yourself in this kind of broader context, it's, um, it is tough. So talk with your supervisors, talk with other professors, uh, check where else this particular thing kind of fits, what it is useful for. Um, for example, a lot of um, work that is done in biometrics for like data privacy is generic. It can be used for other applications in data privacy. It's not kind of limited to biometrics. Uh, so they kind of results are kind of generalizable to different architectures of data processing. Uh, and But for a person who sits in biometrics and only works with biometrics, sometimes it looks as if it's only applicable here, right? Sometimes it's kind of really difficult to step up uh, and, and see things from, from outside. So this significance, relevance, and implications, um, yeah, wh why are we talking it kind of towards the end? Um, because usually, um, well, in, in the master thesis, you will kind of do both. So you will kind of uh, start with some general description of the field and the domain that you're working with, and then you drill down to kind of a particular research topic or particular problem that you're solving, and then you kind of uh, reflect on the general like contribution and, and things at the end, right? So you kind of do, you, you do this kind of, um, you know, from general down and to general. In the essay or in a small, small write-up, you don't have time to do that. Uh, so this kind of a significance and implications and so on, they have to be somewhere, but you cannot start with that because you haven't even explained what it is that you have. So it naturally has to be kind of at the end, it has to be like a summary and a reflection. All right, and then the final one is um, future steps, future directions, poten potential improvements, and the limitations of what you've done. Right, so it's sort of like a reflecting on the process and reflecting on the what has been done, what has been solved, and what isn't. So we discussed it just a minute ago about like valuable insights into what's not solved yet. What are the research questions? Those are good things. Um, so um, you often read a paper saying, uh, "Well, there is this." Uh, 
classifier, there is this classifier, and there is this classifier. And I compare them all to my one. My one is the best. It's so it classifies everything kind of the best. That's it. The end. You know, you can stop. Everybody can stop their research. Uh, that's the you know that's the best one there is. Um, well, not really. Like you are the person who knows exactly what are the limitations of what you have. You highlighted that it's better than those four or those whatever comparisons you've done, but you can also tell what are the weak points, what how it can be improved. Even if you haven't done it yet, you can kind of highlight it, and then other people can continue. Right? Research is never finished. Like research is always kind of a process, so you can always make things better. You can always things work for other domains or be applicable in other domains and so on and so forth. So, and you being so intimate with what you've created of what you know, you are the best suited to highlight all those things, right? And that's very valuable. So often it happens that it's the third party which point out some limitations, right? But yes, of course, you can do that this way as well. You can kind of criticize some something because you got some insights and you know what are the weak points. And your contribution is this kind of pointing out of those limitations. But the original authors, the original people who spend a lot of time on the original thing, they are be better suited to do that quickly and efficiently and already in the original paper, right? So if you can do that, if you can highlight what was your claim or what was your contribution and um, uh, what you achieved, but highlight, okay, then what's next? What, you know, what can be done with it? then you demonstrating kind of a, a certain level of maturity and reflection that you can put in. How much it is important in the essay? Not that important. Uh, we don't expect, you know, a, a, a really big comprehensive future work kind of section in an essay, which is only two pages. But in your thesis, you will have something like that, right? So in an essay, if you have one sentence or like two sentences about, okay, uh, what could be done to strengthen the result? What else could be done to kind of uh, highlight the strong points? What can be done to patch some of the weak points or you highlight yourself some weak points? That's good, right? So um, all those things we, which we just discussed, they usually a section or a chapter in the master thesis, right? In the essay, it, it may be just a sen sentence, or it could be like half a sentence, right? But if you think about it, and if you put this sentence or two sentences in, you will kind of into the habit of thinking about it, and then in your thesis, it will be more natural for you to have it organized properly. So even though the essays have to use a lot of shortcuts, and even though the essays have to, uh, you know, uh, dumb down some of the things that we are just discussing, and you can do it more thoroughly and more proper in the master thesis. In the essay, you still have enough space to inject like a statement or two statements to highlight some of those things and then make it better, right? <clears throat> so for essay two and three, uh, I want you to sort of think of those uh, seven points that are listed uh, and pay attention of, of, of how you're doing it. Um, all right, so let's have a, a short break. Um, and then what we will do is we will um, briefly discuss the, uh, the essays and the reviews and the review process itself. So after the break, yeah, uh, we go back to that. All right.
So let's uh, review some of the reviews that we had. So um, what can we do? So first, reviews. Um, In the past, with the course, we had two types of reviews. So the first type of review was the kind of a typical review of what somebody else did, right? So you point out the methodology problems, you point out illogical things, you comment on the structure, you comment on how the how easy it is to follow the article, um, you kind of uh, highlight what it is about. Um, and and so on and so forth. You don't necessarily comment on the merits. You kind of uh, point out how it could be done better, uh, but you don't question the. Um, um, I mean, I mean, you, you do question the methodology if if it's broken, but you don't discuss the results. You you don't say, oh yeah, those results are kind of not significant or they kind of whatever, like you, you don't engage in kind of uh, counter-arguing the author, right? Um, and the other type of reviews was the counter-arguing of the author. Your task was to find evidence that he is wrong or she is wrong, right? You, it was to find out kind of a discourse argument saying whatever they're arguing for is wrong because, and you provide evidence why it's wrong, right? And you don't comment on the on the rest, on the structure of the article, whatever. You just comment on the on the claim and counter claim it, right? So those are two a kind of uh, use cases for writing a review. One is to counter the claim, and one is just to kind of review what has been done, what has been written. Um, so most of the reviews are in the second category. They don't rebuffle the claims. They kind of uh, do the um, only the commenting on the structure and on the merits of the arguments. Um, because the first essay was not necessary to have a claim, uh, it wasn't possible to say you have to counter somebody because if somebody was doing a review of a paper, you cannot counter that. Like, okay, they reviewed the paper, like there is no counter. You can just review the review. You can say they could have done a better job or they've done a good job, whatever. But you cannot really counter what they are saying because they're not really claiming anything. They just kind of are making a review. Last year, yeah, we had some, um, like you can nitpick a little bit. So if someone says that the article was of good quality, you can kind of say, no, it isn't because, and you can provide evidence that it's of poor quality. So you can kind of argue against some very micro claims done in the review, right? Uh, but yeah, that's kind of more of a game than, than kind of, uh, uh, yeah. But for this one, uh, what we uh, what we will do is for the second essay, the reviews will be a counter. So because the second essay, you have to have a claim and you have to back up your claim then the reviewer has to claim the opposite and provide evidence that his claim is correct, not the original claim is correct, right? Uh, and then for the final review, we will go back to just review being a review and it's up to the reviewer to decide whether they want to rebuff the claim or whether they want just to review the, the, the essay, right? Uh, so it can be a mix, it's up to the reviewer. But for the second review, what we will do is we will try to focus on the review being kind of the rebuffle of the claims being made in the essay. Uh, and you will try to find arguments and evidence that they are incorrect. How can you do that? Well, you can find some papers which claim the opposite. You can uh, find some illogical argumentations about the logic of the argument in the first place. You can try to... Um, show that the assumptions that are made explicitly or implicitly in the paper that they are incorrect, therefore the follow-up is kind of incorrect, um, and so on. So you, you try to use uh, some techniques for claiming the opposite to what is being claimed in the original article. Uh, because the review is supposed, supposedly a review, it's not a full essay, 
uh, you can do a little bit more sloppy job, right? So you don't have to be as methodical and as kind of a concise. You can be kind of a little bit patchy. You can say the assumptions are kind of bad and this is bad and this is bad. And then that's it. Like you don't have to have like a follow through argument that your claim is correct. You just have to show that the other claim is incorrect. But if you can show that by showing your claim is correct, that's one of the tactic, right? One of the methods. Um, so the purpose of that exercise is to be kind of a devil's advocate. You may actually believe or you may agree with the claim. You may say, ah, yeah, he's right. I mean, it's logical and it's all good. Like, But then you have to, even then you have to think what can potentially be wrong? What assumptions can I question? What, you know, how can I uh, highlight the, the weak points? Um, this is important because when you will be doing your master thesis, you often have consciously or subconsciously an idea of what you want to get. Uh, if you're working on a new classifier for AI or whatever, you really hope it's better than the existing ones or it's faster or whatever in some way you make an improvement, right? Uh, and you do structure your experiments and you do certain things um, in a certain way to, um, to kind of achieve what you want. Um, but by playing a devil's advocate on yourself or on your own beliefs, you can sort of uh, um, be better and uh, highlighting and nitpicking on things that can potentially be wrong. Um, we had, uh, when Simon was here, we used to do debates with um, Stuart in front of uh, audiences. And uh, Stuart and Simon, like Stuart is a Catholic and Simon is an atheist. So they were arguing for or against God, for example. But before the argument, they were tossing a coin. Who will argue for what? <laughs> so sometime it was Simon arguing for God and Stuart being an atheist, right? Uh, which is kind of interesting to turn around your own worldview and kind of see the arguments and uh, from a different perspective. We had the same in some of the Stuart's classes for security uh, uh, exercises. Like we had two teams which were doing some things and then sometimes before the debate we were tossing a coin which one will be arguing for and which one will be arguing against something, right? Um, so then you have to prepare your arguments and, and so on. Um, it's a form of exercise. It's a form of a mental exercise for being able to kind of go out of your box to kind of see, uh, you know, other side of the of the exercise. Okay, so um, let's start with the last one. So the last one is about this uh, cloud RAM uh, idea. Uh, so CRAM. Um, and it is kind of like a review of a paper. Um, so it, yeah, the, the idea is that mobile devices have limited capacity, uh, both memory and processing, and to make them kind of more robust and more uh, scalable and so on, you can use a cloud backend for storage, for memory, and for processing. Uh, and you can do that uh, seamlessly in such a way that the app can offload some things to the cloud uh, and the programmers can kind of benefit from it. So the, the essay is basically a review uh, explaining what the paper is about and it has only one reference uh, and then it has a title, CRAM, the next step in mobile device memory. Um, it doesn't have a kind of a succinct summary at the beginning uh, of what this essay is about. It kind of jumps directly into kind of the discussion of the, of the paper. Um, it doesn't have much of a structure, like it has paragraphs, but you cannot, it doesn't have like a well-defined sections. It's kind of like a, a flow. Um, it is okay language-wise. Um, there was um, it. It's not. Um, so when we go back to this list of things that we should pay attention to, so it's not 
that clear what the value is of the of the review uh, it's not clear whether this review is to make me read the original paper or make me understand what the paper is about so I don't have to read it uh, it doesn't make a lot of claims about the quality um, and the rest is kind of it's okay um, so then um, we have the review uh, and the review kind of yeah says what what, what I just said um, with um, the except yeah with, with the uh, focus on um, pointing out some of the weak aspects so being kind of very broad and generic and then going into a details towards uh, later in the in the paper and the last paragraph of the um, of the review highlights that uh, a lot of sections were taken verbatim from the original paper right um, so there are three levels to this point so first one is you have original paper you have somebody saying things and then you kind of uh, let's say you're writing a review which you want to convey uh, the meaning of the paper to the reader so the reader doesn't need to read it they can understand what it's about and what it contributes by reading your stuff right uh, can you reuse the text from the original paper should you reuse the text from the original paper and how to reuse the text from the original paper in quotes I mean, like the best way to explain uh, somebody's papers is with their own words. Yeah. No so yeah, you probably sh you could use their words, uh, but you should like make sure that the reader knows that it is their words. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that's correct. So typically, what we want is we want to use our own words. Uh, we want to paraphrase it and we want to explain it in our own way, in our own words, right? Um, there are two or more exceptions to that. So sometimes by paraphrasing, you might change the meaning of something. So you're kind of explaining something to somebody, uh, and then by doing that, you kind of are changing the original meaning or the original things, right? And if you don't want to do that, you may want to quote, right? So you may, instead of paraphrasing, you may want to say, they said this, and I leave it to the reader to interpret it, what they really meant, because I think they meant this, but maybe the reader will, me they think they meant this, right? If I paraphrase it, I, I, I kind of implicitly reinterpret what I mean, I mean what they mean by what I think they mean, right? Um, so most of the time it's fine most of the time the whatever we are paraphrasing is so generic that our take on it and somebody objectively reading it is the same uh, so it doesn't matter but sometimes we don't want to have this risk to be misinterpreted or misunderstood um, the second one is with definitions if they have some definitions like what should we do should we invent our own definitions no should we claim those are our definitions? No, they, they, they were defined over there. So we have to quote them, right? So for some of the definitions or some of the um, you know, things that are already there, we cannot really change them, we can quote them. But we have to be clear of quoting. We have to make it sure that the reader knows it's not our words, it's the words from the other paper, right? Uh, if the reader is misled, if the reader reading our stuff thinks those are our words but in fact those are words written over there we violating kind of two contracts one is the social contract which is uh we consciously or subconsciously taking credit for something that we haven't done uh, and second of all we kind of uh plagiarizing somebody's work yeah yeah you kind of met uh a more PMS on the way here and you were saying that our public Publicated paper did exactly that. Yeah. It took a quote and changed a few of the words. Yeah. And passed it on as its own. So it does kind of happen in publication. It it got published, publicated, right? Without yeah. being quote for plagiarizing. Yeah, but 
it's still it's not right. It's like not being caught doesn't make it good, right? Doesn't make it proper. Uh, and we should avoid it, and we should kind of uh, try to prevent it. Um, so, what's the um, th there is no real reason not to quote or not to attribute somebody else's work. Uh, it's fine. Um, th there is no benefit of taking credit for something that you haven't done. Um, yeah, okay, there might be some benefits, yes, uh, <laughs> financially and, and whatever, but you should not do that. Um, and also, so let's say, um, Let's say I have two master theses, okay? One uh, is written by a student who uh, says, okay, all of that is mine, right? And it's like all his work, right? And one is a student who says, this is this guy's work, 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 and I'm kind of synthesizing and I'm quoting and I'm paraphrasing, but I'm attributing all those people. To me, this one is much, much more valuable than this no matter what the claims are, right? Because I can tell that this person knows much more about the research area, even though that might know enough or the same, it's just that it's not clear from reading the text, right? Um, and I also have a kind of more in-depth understanding of this person's appreciation of the state of the art, whereas this person is doing something in their own box. They might be completely wrong, right? I mean, uh, you know, whatever they say is not actually relevant because they might be saying the same thing. It's just that this person claims I'm saying all of this, right? Uh, but just from the presentation point of view, it looks as if it's like a black box, whereas this is much more open and more informed the, uh, uh, research. So this one will get higher grade than this one, no matter what. And this one doesn't run any risk of being caught of plagiarizing anything, right? So there is kind of no, um, in the, like a prisoner's dilemma <laughs> game, like if you have two choices, this one is like a Pareto optimal, like it's better on, on a, all the possible outcomes that the, to do this one in the context of writing a master thesis, right? If you plagiarize your master thesis, maybe the only thing you can win is like s saving time, but then like who, who are you cheating? You're cheating kind of yourself really, right? Um, I, I, like, I don't care if you plagiarize something and you got master's degree, like, and you can, were not caught. Like, sure, things happen, people publish plagiarized master thesis and they that got caught, and so what. Uh, but you didn't learn much anyway, right? Um, so, I don't know, like, I, I, I think plagiarizing is not good, I think quoting is good, but then, if you overquote, it's annoying, right? Like, if you say, this guy said this and you have a quote, this guy said this and you have a quote, like, it, it is kind of, it doesn't flow, it doesn't kind of has, it doesn't have a nice structure to it. So, over-quoting is kind of not good in a sense of style and in a sense of, like, explaining what you mean. Uh, so, it's better to paraphrase. It's more work, but it's better. If you don't want to paraphrase everything, of course, you can quote, but you should not over-quote. Uh, and you should always attribute. So even if you're paraphrasing, you should always attribute that you're paraphrasing or you're explaining what has been written somewhere else. Um, so that's, yeah, that's this one. Um, uh, let's do um, the first one. So let's do uh, the unsupervised learning one. Uh, so that one has a claim. Uh, it's quite straightforward. It kind of uh, says upfront, you know, what it is about, uh, what is the goal, uh, what is the value as well. So it, it's uh, kind of a well defined. Um, it doesn't have uh, sections or anything neither. It has a bibliography kind of uh, isolated, but it does feel it's logically structured uh, to have the generic. Um, intro and then kind of the meat and then the conclusion, right? So it says, I'm going to do this. This is the evidence. Okay. I'm concluding what I set to conclude, right? Um, so in that context, I, I felt it was the, uh, the closest to the one making kind of the claim and building some evidence. Um, is it a strong 
case, no, it's not. I mean, it's an essay, <laughs> you know, two pages, one reference. You cannot really draw a, a very solid conclusion based on the evidence that you can ac accumulate here. Uh, so maybe what I would uh, inject was this kind of uh, reflection that it has some limitations. Like, I'm making this claim, but you know, you should not really believe me yet because it's kind of a weak claim, right? Uh, it's not a solid claim. The next step would be to collect other papers and other evidences that would make it stronger. Uh, but apart from that, it's, it's kind of fine. Um, and then the review um, was kind of, yeah, again, similar to what I'm saying. Uh, the review has a structure, so it's a kind of a summary and a, <laughs> and a review. It has a title which says exactly what this is. Um, so on those points, you know, good points. Um, and yeah, the rest is um, kind of an analysis what has been claimed and how it has been backed up. And that the first one was sort of easier, the second one was harder, and it kind of goes a little bit into a details of what has been argued in the original uh, article. Um, sometimes, um, so th th this is not to, uh, to criticize or to comment on the review itself, just a general comment. Uh, sometimes when we're reviewing, um, I wonder whether we as a reviewers have the obligation to check if the original, if we are not familiar with the original paper, uh, if the kind of a summary and the uh, things that are described actually fit with the original paper. Um, and the answer to that ideally is yes, but in practice it's hard, especially like in, thi in, in this case it's kind of okay to read the paper, right? But if you're reviewing a paper which has like 30 references and you're only familiar with like five, if you have to read 25 references and check uh, whether they actually, uh, you know, match what the person is saying, um, so we as reviewers are kind of using a shortcut. We kind of believe that the, whoever is reviewing is doing kind of a proper job. Uh, and um, I think it's acceptable one, one level down, right? So let's say uh, for this particular case, if you're reviewing someone who reviewed the article, you're giving them the benefit of a doubt and saying they probably did it correctly, right? And now if I'm reviewing the reviewer, then I cannot trust that those two levels down is correct. I have to check myself, right? <laughs> so what happened was, and, I, and Simon had similar situation in the past, is that often you have an article uh, which says like, Let's say uh, person A says, in this article, they claimed some things and they proved some things, right? And this original article gets not very popular, but this one gets very popular. And people are quoting this guy saying, there is an evidence that this is correct, but it's a second level of truth. And then it turns out the original paper never said that, right? <laughs> that the original paper, like this reviewer or this person who used this original case actually misinterpreted it. And this one is incorrect. It's cited a million times. A lot of people are saying, yeah, it proves something. But you go to the source, it's like, he never said that. Like, he never said that's true, right? Why are you kind of saying that? <laughs> so if it's more than one level up, I think you have the duty to check uh, yourself. Because then you, you're running a risk of propagating something that might be uh, actually not true. Uh, if you're just doing this one level up, Maybe you should do the check, but um, and so on. So, for example, here um, you kind of qualifying, or the reviewer is kind of qualifying that the uh, conclusions are kind of drawn correctly based on the evidence. That that's fine, right? But then, if I'm quoting this person saying, "Now we have the evidence that it's true," <laughs> uh, maybe not. Maybe I should check the original paper if that actually is true, right? Um, yeah. All right. So. <laughs> Those are the um, the comments. I, I kind of enjoyed uh, reading this one uh, because I felt out of all of the uh, essays, uh, it was sort of the um, the closest to the one that I expect for the second review kind of a second essay um, um, exercise. Um, 
So what else can we say? Uh, let's do Machi. So uh, he has this uh, P2P systems. Um, so that one doesn't have a title. Uh, it has a date, right? Should you date your essays? Yeah, you should. Uh, should you state the authorship? Yeah, you probably should, and you should have a title, right? Uh, so that one has the authorship, date, but no, no, no real title. Like saying essay one doesn't really tell me what it is about. Like, should I read it? Like, okay, I have to read it because I'm a lecturer, but you know, <laughs> uh, you're not writing it for the lecturer. Supposedly, you're writing it for the audience, right? So let's say you are now preparing for the exam and you want to read the essays people wrote and you go essay one, like what is this about, right? You don't know. You have to start reading to know is it something you want to learn more about or not. Um, so this one also is um, um, so it starts with for my first essay I have chosen to review a paper called blah blah blah, right? Um, so on the positive side, uh, we have this debate whether you should use passive voice or active voice. And this author, uh, he's using active voice. He says, I'm doing this and, and so on, right? It's good. Like in English, we tend to do that in the active voice. The narrative is a bit more engaging. You always have the, you know, the hero <laughs> of the story. Uh, and so on. If you use passive voice in some languages, like in German and in Norwegian and in Polish as well, the academic writing tend to be written in the passive voice. You say, uh, cooperative caching for multimedia data has been chosen to be reviewed in this essay or something, right? Uh, yes, you can write like that, but it's dry. It's a little bit non-engaging and so on. And in English, it sounds kind of a bit awkward. In some languages, people are used to it, so they, they write this way. But in English, yeah, you probably should use um, uh, active voice. Um, so that's fine. But the tone is a little bit cat, uh, chatty, right? So like, oh yeah, for my first essay, I chose this, right? Um, yeah, it's not too bad, but you could make it a little bit more formal, right? You could uh, uh, skip the uh, I have chosen. Right, um, or you could kind of make it a little bit more, um, uh, yeah, non-chronological. Right, like what we what we don't want, and especially in the master thesis, we don't want a chronological account of what you've been doing over the last half a year. Right, uh, that I've I've written this uh, literature review, and then I've interviewed those people and I've done this and I chatted with my supervisor and I've done that and it's like a, a hero's journey right like in, in chronology like oh yeah like the reader doesn't care what you've been doing over the last six months the reader cares what are the conclusions what are the logical inferences what is the value what you know what is it for me for the reader right I'm kind of not really interested in your life story uh, maybe your mom is, maybe your friends are, but like, you know, I'm not really. Uh, just, you know, give me the facts, give me the, uh, the meat of the, of the writing. Uh, so organizing things into kind of like a chatty story uh, doesn't really work that well. So uh, try to not do that. Um, and then um, there was um, some small things. Um, so, for example, like uh, you say, uh, uh, the reviewer says, the paper also has issues with a very rigid way of structuring the sections. Um, so what's the difference between very rigid way and rigid way? Uh, I don't know. Uh, try to avoid things that are vague, which don't really bring uh, additional information. So if you, if you said, the paper also has issues with rigid way of structuring, then I can imagine kind of being rigid and being non-rigid. But being very rigid and rigid, I don't know what, what are the definitions, what are the boundaries, right? Um, so words like very, um, you know, bad. So he, he also says, in addition to the bad terminology, so what is bad? Is it like typos? Is it grammatically incorrect? Is it like 
misusing the term in a context that shouldn't be used, what the bad means. I don't know. Um, so if you use a precise word like, you know, for example, saying misusing the terminology, right? So I know, okay, somebody was using term in a context which is not supposed to use it. But saying bad terminology, I don't know what, what bad is. Um, so it's a vague word. It's, it, it, um, so avoiding those makes the writing kind of, uh, m makes the writing better. Other than that, it was okay as well. Uh, it, it was on a more chatty side, um, the, uh, the, um, the essay itself, right? Um, is it bad? Um, not necessarily, but we, we talked about those registers. We have the kind of the more formal register for communicating facts and communicating research and more chatty register for telling stories and communicating with friends, right? So if you using the, um, if you're using the more kind of a lightweight register for describing your methodology or describing kind of a research outcomes, you're running a risk of the reader not taking you seriously or, or misunderstanding you that, or maybe he's just joking. Maybe he doesn't mean it's a life-changing, you know, uh, discovery. It's like just a figure of speech, right? We don't want those kind of uh, uh, misinterpretations to happen. We want, like, what we want to say is the facts, and we want them to be treated as facts. And where we are doing some stipulations or some, uh, um, some uh, like, our own interpretations, we say that. We like, we don't know, we don't have evidence, but we think that, right? So we want to be kind of upfront, uh, but we want to use this formal register for the general writing, so we convey the message of like being thorough and very being proper. Um, there is a trade-off, like if you do it too much, it's very dry and boring to read as well, right? So try to be formal but try not to be overly dry and always passive voice and things like that right but yeah so i cannot tell you do this and it will be always good it a lot of that depends on the on the reader as well so some readers are more kind of uh, chatty they more like the kind of a story some readers are like no it's not scientific writing it's like you know uh, children's story like okay that, I, I kind of distrust, I have a distrust to that. I don't believe that you were a solid researcher who was doing solid methodology if you're writing this way, right? So it, it's a little bit, and it might be unjustified, it might be just bias, right? But the reader will have some bias. So to be on the safe side, try to be kind of um, more formal, avoid the um, uh, vague words like many, much, bad, very, things like that which are not precise. Use instead a precise word. Um, Alright, um, so which one? Um, oh yeah, there was one, I think it was, um, let me see, it's the uh, so Christopher's review was, um, uh, so there was a title, uh, so what it was about, and then it had kind of a very uh, well laid out structure, but it was quite, um, um, so, so I would say it has, it has the middle, it doesn't have the beginning and doesn't have the end, right? Um, so all the evidence and all the data and things are there. Uh, why we have it here, it's not explained. So the, the beginning is missing, like one sentence or like one paragraph about what we're doing. And then kind of a, a, a kind of a summarizing conclusions, like, okay, what, what, what does it mean? Like, what can we get from it, right? So the middle is there. Uh, the beginning at the end is kind of a little bit missing, right? Uh, and then the structure is there. Should we, f um, if we're doing a review, sometimes we follow a very formal structure like this. Uh, sometimes we follow it, but it's kind of in the text. It's not that, you know, it's not necessary that you have sections like that, but you address those points kind of one by one. Uh, so it's up to the reviewer to decide uh, how to do that. Um, so for example, when we will be doing the review 
for the second essays, which is a counter, that structure wouldn't fit. It would be kind of like a substructure for arguing. But you do need kind of a, a, a meta structure, which is for countering the claim, right? Um, so then you can use, or a reviewer can use this one as a kind of a mini structure within an, a, a larger argument, but the larger argument has to have its own kind of a meta structure uh, with um, typically with um, some beginning collecting the evidence and then drawing the final conclusion. Um, all right, so in over, overall, it wasn't um, nothing, no, no essay was like terribly bad. Uh, they were kind of uh, similar. Um, some were more on the reviewing side, some were more on the claim side. So for the second one, we want everybody to do the claim. Uh, the reviews were constructive. They were pointing out how things could be improved, which is good. Uh, they were also highlighting the good and the bad aspects of the essays, which was in general kind of good. So I, I think um, within the limits of, of a single first essay, I think they were, they were good. Uh, on the merits, like how valuable would be for someone to read those essays when preparing for the oral exam, I would say, yeah, average, right? Uh, so I would like for the second essays, for the essays to be more than average. The, to try to think, if you are gonna prepare for the uh, oral exam and you're gonna refresh yourself knowledge about some topics, uh, how would you write an essay that helps you to, to do that? Or uh, this essay would also help all the other students, right? Uh, so some essays were good they, in, in that they were providing a kind of a, a review and some evidence and some uh, material that is useful to re recall, to remember, but some were not that, um, that useful. So try to not focus because of the limited space. You have to kill your darlings. You have to skip some things that you think are not that important, right? And only focus on the important things. So try to focus on things that are kind of helping and the ones which are kind of neutral or not helping kind of don't write about it, right? That's what I was also mentioning about the quality. Um, if you picked a, a bad article as an as a argument for your claim, you've done a bad job, right? I, I'm, I'm presuming you've picked a good quality article, right? So talking about the quality, yeah. Um, okay, so that's it. Uh, we run out of time. Do you have any questions?